it recording? I think we're recording. Hi, Mike. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today. Um, and I've, I wanted to say personally a very big thank you for all the all the work you're doing on exposing the the family justice system. Um, I know you're you're over in in America, but from the sounds of things, it is exactly the same. We have exactly the same issues and problems over here in in the UK. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for all your work. It, it's very important. And for those viewers who, who are watching now, um, can you just start off by introducing yourself and, um, and also tell everyone about how you first came to Exposing the Family Court? Sure. So my name is Mike Volpe. I'm an investigative journalist. So I do all kinds of stuff and I still do. Uh, like I do a lot of work on immigration related things, political corruption, cops, a lot of bad cops out there. Um, but in 2013, I received uh, a, uh, a press release from a group that wanted to expose Child Protective Services in Pennsylvania, which is a state in, in the US. And so it looked kind of interesting. They seem to have a lot of victims and I pitched it to a place. It's called uh, World Net Daily, though now go by WND.com. And you can still find the article. And it was just CPS coming in, taking kids, Willy nilly, they don't have a warrant, they don't have a reason, and then they, they'll keep them and they refuse to give them back. And it was just horror story after horror story. And that article did pretty well. And so one of the people I talked to, her name was Connie Valentine. She runs the California Protective Parents Association, which is uh, uh, caters mostly actually to, to California and other states. It's like the prototype of victims like you, uh, and specifically the parental alienation. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll take on any case, but they actually, they were the first ones to tell me that uh, women primarily, when they allege abuse, when their kids allege abuse, and it's not the one, that's the key, it's not the one the woman alleges abuse, it's when the kid does. Because uh, women, you know, adults lie all the time. Kids are, uh, lie a lot less, it's possible, but they were the first one to say that th there's a parental alienation scam that goes along. And uh, so one, uh, so at one point I asked her, well, you, you seem to know a lot. What, what's the biggest problem that you see? And she was like corrupt custody evaluators. And I don't know if in England they, they have a lot of this, but one of the things we do in the U.S. is that the judge is allowed to, to, to look at a case and go, boy, this is really complicated. I can't make the decision on my own and appoint people and force you to pay them. And a custody evaluator is one of many people they can appoint. And it's a total scam. Uh, it's, uh, they, it's often these people don't have kids of their own. Sometimes they're gay, but they're, they're supposedly no, like they'll evaluate and they'll say, here's the good points of this parents, here's the bad point. And they'll almost give you like a scale. So you'll come at the like 83, your ex comes at 75. So obviously you should have physical custody. It's almost like that total scam, complete nonsense. And, and they have rules that are almost never followed. And so that was like my entree. And so I asked her to get me in contact with a few victims. And before I knew it, I talked to like 20, 25. And I sort of went from there. The hard part is, and I think there's some of this in, in England too, the media here doesn't like these stories. It's, I, I I started this in 2013. At the time, it was like, no, they didn't want any part of it. They're, they're more open to them now, but they're still very tough to get approved for a variety of reasons. And the main one, in my opinion, is that the threat of a lawsuit on a story like this is exponentially higher. Like if I, if the president swings through and I got to go cover that speech, which obviously will be pretty well read, no threat of lawsuit. This is just exponentially higher. And so that's how I got into it. And just the stories keep coming and then other things that have unraveled. The other thing is to me, number one, this is a, the problem in the U S is part global uh, in the sense that domestic violence victims specifically using this parental alienation scam are mistreated all around the world. Uh, secondly, um, abusive and arrogant judges is not only not new, but like, like your judge, Jeremy Lee, yeah. He's not the, 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 the case that, that I think is most like yours, uh, the Rucky case, that judges, they're, they're all the same. The, the hubris, the arrogance, the feeling that because it's my courtroom, I can do whatever I want. I can tell you to whatever you want to do. That's not different. And I think that's global. And 
I, I think people have just accepted that judges behave this way for a really long time, mm -hmm. even though the, it, one thing that's crazy about judges is that they have all these canons, like rules that they're supposed like no bias, always courteous, always professional. Like if they followed all the canons, they'd have no power because mm -hmm. they'd always have to speak in a soft tone. They couldn't ever come down on anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is very professional, no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, and they never follow any of them. And this is not the, the U.S. It's global. Uh, like the, the thing about your judge is, and, and maybe he realizes, maybe he doesn't. He's he's like a caricature. There, there's a million guys like him. They're so full of hubris that they don't care what the evidence is. Maybe he's. And by the way, if he's bribed, which is entirely possible, he's definitely not some anomaly. I I absolutely believe the judge in the rookie case, David Knudsen, is bribed. Not only do I believe it, I was told the exact amount, nearly a million dollars, was told the exact way. I don't have the actual like physical evidence of like the transfer. However, what I can tell you is I've, conf I've asked him and others multiple times, was he bribed? Now you would think if the judge isn't bribed, someone with like righteous indignation would say, Mike, our judges are not bribed. Yes. This is an outrageous accusation if you print it you will get sued. No, that yeah. never happened. Yeah. So um, can you just explain to people watching the rookie case, you know, just mm -hmm. explain okay. exactly what so, happened in that case? So I'll explain what happened in the case. But before that, your people call you Sam, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So her name is Sandra Grazini Rucky. People call her Sam. Okay. She's got dark hair like you. You were smeared by the BBC, right? Yes. She was smeared by 2020, which is almost the exact equivalent in the US. Right. She alleged physical abuse, a little sexual. Yours, so the abuse was slightly different, but we're like getting into technicalities. Both of you were accused of parental alienation. You escaped with your kids. She hid her kids. How many, you, you had like the, like the special forces equivalent of the police? Yeah. She, tracking you. She had the US Marshals tracking her. She had four rifles put to her head. Wow. Uh, so kind of what, what, the reason I can't let it go, I don't believe in coincidences. There's a show, I don't, you guys probably get NCIS there. One of the rules Gibbs has. There's no such thing as a coincidence. I don't believe that I found two women, especially with the same name, across the pond, who happen to be smeared in the exact same way by their equivalent of the mainstream media, who were chased by the top law enforcement agents, who were also accused of parental alienation as they disclosed the abuse. Yes. There's some global phenomenon. So basically, the Rucky case might be the most notorious custody case in US history. And two of the kids ran, they were hidden for two and a half years. The mom is a six time felon, that's one difference. They didn't decide to charge you. Uh, she's a six time felon based on what happened. But her, her kids, everyone said this guy is abusive. He's got police reports in three counties. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent is in England, but he once put a gun to his kid's head according to a CPS report, choked his wife, choked his daughter according to police reports, audio recordings and the evidence against him. It's like on and on and on. Witnesses will come forward. Like he threatened to kill his in-law one time. So that's in a police report. Mm -hmm. Threatened to kill his neighbors multiple times. So that's in a police report. He had a road rage incident. That's in a police report. None of it is enough, right? It, it's just like yours. You begged for the, 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 the drug test. And when that comes back yeah. positive, they still spin that. It's the yeah. same thing yeah. because what, what would happen to him is either the charges would go away or they'd let him plead guilty to something so insignificant that no court would say it's enough. Yeah. So they're like, well, you haven't shown us any evidence. All right. The, the kid, the, the gun to the head, that ultimately resulted in nothing. He told CPS, the child tells CPS, yes, dad stuck a gun to my head, but CPS ultimately unfunded. We couldn't, because he was saying it when he was like 14 or 15 and it happened when he was eight. So how do we substantiate that? And it's um, always unsubstantiated. So I to say as well, just to clarify for the English viewers, CPS in America is um, child right, the equivalent, of, right? It's the equivalent of CAFCAS. Right, yeah. it's the equivalent yeah, yeah. of CAFCAS. So he's got police reports, child protective services. People see him, his neighbors, in-laws. They all say he's violent. So it's not just to the family. So they start the divorce, and here the part that almost no one knows: they initially settle. And he, he gets most of like their assets, which were significant millions. Uh, she gets custody. And then he immediately challenges custody 
And then they switched the, the, the judges and they switched to a new judge, David Knudsen. So he slowly worms so that the David gets more and more custody. And, and then they, they use court professionals. So the, and, and this, again, I think is a little different. What then Knudsen does is he appoints like, like a battery of people who then they are the ones first suggesting parental alienation. So it's like, it wasn't me, the experts that you appointed. And right. just explain to those people, Mike, who don't know about what, what is the definition of parental alienation and how is I'm it? Glad, I'm glad you asked that. Well, there is no one definition, which is one of many problems. But uh, the way I, in layman's terms, it's when one parent turns the child or children against the other parent during a divorce, which all sounds great, but good luck in real life figuring out. And the, the, like one example, I always say, what's the difference between an alienated child and James Dean and rebel without a cause? Cause he didn't like either parent. He seemed pretty alienated. So what's the difference? Is he alienated? Cause, cause if, if the James Dean prototype is alien, then, then we get like 99% of, of uh, teenagers who are alienated. So uh, one of many problems is everyone applies it to their own case. Like my assumption, like your ex was saying, I didn't drug my kids. She drugged them. She did it to frame me. It's a form of parental alienation, right? Yeah. Well, right. It, was, he it, just say it was the judge who came up with that. My ex actually kept pretty quiet about it, and his barrister would put forward all these bizarre theories. I right. put forward that she drugged the boys to get them to go to sleep. You know, there was all these different right. kinds of theories. So the but and then the, the <laughs> judge then this yeah. But who's the first person to say the term parental alienation? Um, do you know, I think. I think it was it was a combination of my ex's barrister, who was very mm -hmm. hot on things, young guy, mm -hmm. um, up and coming, etc. And it was also mentioned by Kafkas. Um, right. If I recall, I don't, I'm not I, it, I, as to who came first, whether it was Kafkas or him. I think it might have been his barrister who mentioned okay. it. So I, it, I, it, I didn't know what that at the time. I hadn't, I hadn't even heard of it. Yeah, it sort of works the same way. So, and then the judges say, well, it wasn't me. You know, this was suggested by Kafkas first. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way they use the leverage. But it's, it's a bogus term because it's whatever you want it to be. In David Ruckey's case, he's basically saying, my kids don't want to spend time with me and there's no reason. It couldn't be the gun to the head. And yeah. the court, <laughs> and so the court said, well, we don't believe there was any abuse. So there's no reason for them not to like you. So we'll make them. And so I did another one. The woman's name is Julie Goffstein. She was an Orthodox Jew. Her husband was an Orthodox Jew. Their six kids were Orthodox Jews. And then he decided to be a Christian and then he, they wouldn't follow him. So he said, well, I'm being alienated. Oh. Uh, and a judge bought that. So it's, I, and look, I can come up with a million of them and they're all different. Yeah. And so the problem is you take this basket and it's everybody gets to say, whatever happened to me, that's parental alienation. Well, that's not real. When yeah. it's whatever anybody yeah. wants it to be. So yeah. that, Interesting. that's one of many problems I have with it. And look, it's in the Woody Allen case that's on yes. HBO. I don't know if you guys can get it, but I, yeah, they I actually do it, talk yeah. about it. Woody's one of the first people to, to use this. He was saying that Mia was putting the thoughts in Dylan's head, that she was trying to poison the relationship. It's all parental alienation, yeah. all a scam. It was a, he did slightly different things than your ex. It's all variations of themselves. So they start to pump this thing. And then late August, 2012, they order Sam to go see a guy named Paul Reitman, who's supposed to be a specialist in parental alienation. What she didn't know was this guy had just come off probation where he had created a conflict of interest in another case that he admitted to. So they suspend his license. And the first thing they do is give him this appointment, right? right. So he sees her for 20 minutes ask four or five kids, uh, and she has five kids, one question, and then her one question, and then that's it. And then he writes this report that says, oh my God, this situation is so horrible. We need to take action immediately. You've got to take them out. He actually recommended, he called it therapeutic foster care. I don't even know what that is. You can only imagine what would have happened if those kids went to therapeutic foster care. I've heard of that. They call it that over here as well, therapeutic mm -hmm. foster care. Right. It's it, even worse than regular foster care. So the, the lawyer for David, as soon as they get that letter, they file an emergency motion. The judge doesn't even hold a hearing. He calls it a telephonic conference. So everybody's on telephone. There's no witnesses because it's not like people asking questions. They just bad ideas back and forth. So this judge decides that that hearing is September 5. He decides on September 7 to kick mom out of the house. This is an order. Kicks mom out of the house 
She can't tell her kids, doesn't even give custody to David. He gives custody to his sister, moves his sister in. Can you imagine that? Into, her, into this house. The kids come home. They find their mom missing. They all run to a police station. For whatever reason, despite that court order, he lets them live with the other aunt on the other side, on Sam's side. And that continues until April 19th, when the next year, 2013, when they are forced to, uh, to they're then forced to go back and live with, with their Aunt Tammy. Uh, that's the father's sister. And the two oldest girls, they run. They are hidden for two and a half years. No one cares until about two years later, when it starts to receive local coverage, eventually 2020, it's all smears. No one will tell you about the gun to the head. No, no one will tell you this guy's got police reports everywhere. No one will. Uh, There's yeah. Samantha, the, the daughter, uh, she made an audio recording where for two and a half minutes, she described her dad. He drinks, beats my mom silly. Uh, he, she described, he'll run his hands up my leg right next to my private part and just hold it there. Uh, she describes that. So no one will tell you about it as if it doesn't exist. Yeah. So because there was a court order giving dad custody, eventually that happened. And by the way, they had a custody trial. Tell me if you ever heard of this. Part of, part of the custody trial, her attorney was forced to be handcuffed to a wheelchair, would not be let out, made to conduct the trial. It's on video. You can see wow. it. She's just sitting like that and she can't move because she's handcuffed. Have you got so, the link to that so I can put it in the description? Yeah, so, yeah. I will. Uh, so, and, and, and from that, the, the judge who made the, the lawyer, David, gives dad sole custody, says, mom, before you even think about seeing your kids, you have to do like 12 things. If she accomplished the 12 things, most of her kids would be 18 by the time she accomplished them anyway. Yeah. yeah. Right. So because of that court order and the kids are missing. And by the way, so he holds this trial September 11th and 12th, 2013. The girls ran April 19th. Right. So this is the first and only time I've ever heard of a custody trial in absentia because two of the kids were missing anyway. Yeah, you didn't get yeah, custody yeah. of the man on the moon. Yeah. If they're missing, they're, not, they're still missing. So they're missing for two and a half years. Local media coverage eventually drives the police. They find the girls. It creates even more of a media firestorm. 2020 came in. So they're the equivalent of the BBC. They're like a like a news investigative show. So they'll do like a one hour broadcast on a on a Thing, but it's very titillating. The the person who did it, her name was Elizabeth Vargas, who had just come off of like uh, like a sabbatical because she was a drunk. Uh, and I'm not I'm not besmirching her. She was a drunk. She actually had to get treated for alcoholism. This is the first thing back. So they do a hatchet job. They pretend like the evidence, and they were given. I have a document that's 99 pages of like everything from police reports, affidavits, showing how abusive the guy is. Yeah. They didn't get that. They got one that's like 41 pages, but they ignored all of it. It's like 14 police reports and they pretended like they got zero. So they made it seem like mom is making it up. They never used the term parental alienation, but they basically yeah. showed how parental alienation works in their own minds. So now eight, 10 million people watch that. Now she's smeared eight, 10 million people. Now she's facing trial. The judge, totally corrupt. Her name is Karen Asbuck. So nobody knows any of this. In 2009, David Ruck, he screams uncontrollably, swears at kids, uh, his next door neighbors. He gets charged with disorderly conduct. On the eve of trial, they dismiss it for a lack of probable cause. And in the US, it's called a motion. There was no motion by anyone to dismiss it. The judge did it on her own. Wow. Judge's name is Karen Asbuck, same judge who's now going to hear the case. Do you, think, do you think there was bribery involved in that aspect as well? I am like 98.4% certain that Karen has, and I've confronted her as well. Yeah, no, she 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 granted David Rucky also a 50-50 year protective order, barring another woman from saying his name, his kids' names, anything about the case for 50 years. It actually says 2069, right? Wow. I, I don't know. She must she's either bribed. Or his lawyers just always make the really good arguments. Yeah, so it looks like it's bribery. It looks like it's widespread bribery. Like he yeah. he just sued civilly and the judge awarded him like $6 million. And when his lawyer tried to settle, she only asked for 400000 How does your lawyer ask for 400000 and the judge determines that your actual settlement is $6 million? Wow. Sounds like your old lawyer was lowballing it. But yeah, no, I think there's multiple judges that are all being bribed. So she gets tried 
Asphalt won't allow any evidence of abuse. In fact, Asphalt told her, if you testify, you can't say the words protective order, abuse, physical abuse. There's like 20 words that she couldn't use. Uh -huh. But they, they did allow questioning. She had a boyfriend. You know, did you have sex with them? Or how, how serious was it? Because that's obviously very, very relevant, whether or not she may or may not have been having a sexual relationship as all of this was going on. Mm -hmm. So she gets convicted. Uh, but no, and, and by the end, the jury, abduction, not abduction, it's called parental deprivation. So what she was convicted of is because David Rucky had all of this custody time for two and a half years, and she knew where the kids were and didn't tell him, yes. she violated his custody time. So this is key. This was called a state law. This happened in the state of Minnesota, that okay. if, if it was in Florida, let's say another state, probably wouldn't have been a crime, would have been like a civil issue, would have been used to, for contempt of court, maybe put you in jail for contempt of court, but probably to reduce or eliminate your own custody time, but not put you in jail. And there's, uh, and Joanne McDowell, the other woman who, who has a similar case like yours, yeah, it's the yeah. same thing. In that particular state, what she did is a crime, not in every state, usually oh. it's civil, because you usually don't wanna like where two parents get in the middle of that, even with a court order, you wanna let the civil court decide that. So. The other thing about it is, so this crime, by the way, she was the second person convicted. The first person is Caroline Rice, the exact same story. Right. She accused the acts of abuse. Uh, abuse came back with parental alienation, the child ran. Okay, so yeah. those are the two people who were convicted in Minnesota. It's what's called presumed probation. So if you have no criminal record, the judge is supposed to say six months uh, of like probation, community service, no jail time. She not only, she was already held for four months. She gets the maximum, but the judge says, uh, do it over a six year period, 15 days at a time on the anniversary of the girls being found. How so she was supposed it? to go do 15 days that year, then 15 days in the, until she finished it supposedly. Now they eventually got rid of that. So she didn't have to do the 15 days at a time, but she basically was trying to keep her under her thumb. Another reason why I think the judge was, was uh, in on it. And she's totally smeared. Her family has millions and she's homeless and jobless. And uh, the one difference is you were able to fight back media wise. She sort of has. Um, and the media people- Joanne McDowell or the other one, the other case? I'm sorry? Is it Joanne McDowell this one or is it the other? Right, so Joanne McDowell has the exact same, the, this one messes with my head a lot. So she believed her ex was drugging and raping her kids. Does that sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> she begged for a drug test. The courts were resistant to it. Does that sound familiar? Uh, yes. The courts finally agreed to the drug test. The drug test came back positive. She was accused of drugging the kids. There you go. They what the drug test? Were they the same drugs as my children were drugged with? Or? I don't know. I, don't, I didn't look at it at that deep a level, but it, it's basically... That messes with my head. That's exactly yeah. like yours. Yeah. So she runs to Canada with the kids. She goes to a Canadian court, the, the family court equivalent, presents the exact same evidence. And they're like, whoa, yeah. you're staying. Also, your ex can't get within 500 feet of you and you're fine. Yeah. So what's crazy about that case is if he shows up in Canada, he gets arrested, but she still has an arrest warrant active in the US, so she crosses over. So she's forced to live in Canada. Yeah. But those two cases uh, and others, they're all variations of yours. And the only yeah. difference is the continents, not just the countries. Yeah. And yeah, no, I, I, I can find cases like that in Canada, Israel, uh, New Zealand, Australia. The phenomenon is global and it's, it's primarily this misuse of parental alienation. But I think courts in general are, have been for whatever reason trained to be way more skeptical than you're saying. You're, you're not supposed to just accept the allegations, but there's a huge difference between trying to give due process and be skeptical and just never accept any allegations, yeah. no matter what. Absolutely. And so Samantha, in, in her audio recording, she was describing all these court professionals who came on and she goes, unless, Unless you have an audio recording of it, it didn't happen. That's what they would always tell me. Can you imagine? So she's she's not only disclosing, but she's the, the girl is repeatedly telling everyone who will listen, dad is abusing me, he's, dad, he's abusing mom. And instead of taking what she's saying and investigating, unless you put it on video, 
Don't even come to us. And she was 14. Can you imagine? So a 14 year old. Why didn't you think to put it on video? Yeah, exactly. But right. from what, so, watching and look, if it was on video, they'd be like, no, it looks grainy. Uh, no, this looks manipulated. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's never enough. And that's a global phenomenon. That was one of the things that interested me about your case it was the first time that I had seen something that similar outside of the US. And that's when I started looking in other places. And I wondered, um, I don't remember who the member of parliament is, but she was talking about the misuse of parental alienation. It's like a two, two minute clip that I think you first posted. And right about a minute in, she goes, Louise we- Haig, I think maybe, Louise Haig, I think. It's possible, but she said, we imported this from the US. Yes, well, it came from Richard right. Gardner, didn't it originally? Right, it came for Gardner, but you guys have. Yeah. But he, his ideas have spread. But it, look, it's basically, it's the attitude. Yeah. Uh, the attitude the judges are taught is, if it's coming during a custody, it's always a, a tactic. It's all, some lawyer is telling them this will work, which is so ironic because if every judge thinks it's a tactic, why would every lawyer tell a mom to use it? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, doesn't sound like a very good tactic, uh, but this is, there's a, uh, there's a judge out of California, our, our biggest state, a former judge, her name is Deanne Salcida, and she actually gave a kid to a pedophile because she misinterpreted the parental alienation allegations. I don't think she was corrupt because she stopped being a judge as a result of it. Wow. And she was doing a program and she was explaining how judges got trained. And she said, we were drilled with, if be very skeptical, it's often parental alienation if there's abuse allegations during custody. So when this case came up, I was like, oh, this is exactly what they're talking about. And yeah. that's why I gave him custody. But this is what judges are taught. And I don't think it's just in the US. I think it's in the UK. I think it it's everywhere. It seems to be that way. I, I hear a mixture of, you know, obviously the, you talk about possible corruption, bribery, and then mm -hmm. obviously the, there will be some judges who maybe identify with the abuser for, you know, mm -hmm. obvious reasons. Or yet, as you just said then, they're trained to be mm -hmm. suspicious about anyone bringing abuse allegations to the court. In it's the a no-win situation, isn't it? It's just like, well, how on earth? I mean, do you have any, you, you've, uh, you've referred to surveys, haven't you, in your, um, some of the work mm -hmm. you've done, you refer to st surveys that have been carried out and studies that have right. been carried out. Do you have any numbers? So the one that's most often quoted, there's a couple. Uh, so the one that's most often quoted is from 2007. So it's a little dated. It's from the Leadership Council on Interpersonal Violence. And it found that 58,000 children per year are forced into abusive homes by U.S. family courts right. per year. Yeah. So Joanne, Joanne Silber runs the place. She told me primarily that's women, number one, yeah. who are the victims with the kids. And it's parental alienation. Not always. Not always either. Uh, and look, I did... I just did a story about a guy named David Segui, who's a retired baseball player. It's the, he's the one accused of parental alienation and it's yeah. clear his ex-wife is the abused one. Yes. And that can happen. And look, false allegations are a form of abuse, but, uh, and, and I've also noticed that devious women have started to like, we can use this too, basically. More and more women are using it because it, why not? It can work. So, yeah. um, but that's one number. The other number I've heard that I'm having trouble actually confirming is what father's rights people always say is 85% of custody is in the U.S. And this is according to the census. And there's nothing in the U.S. more definitive than this because they actually counted every single person. Right. So when they're saying 85%, that's of 100% count. But the, the woman gets the majority, the physical custody, as we call it. So they're, that, that's the, they're the father's rights people who I don't like, yeah, because uh, I don't, I don't like the the gender aspect of it. But they, their main argument for why um, family courts are against men is that is that stats, which they then they put together didn't. with parental alienation because they look how look how tiny it is. If sixteen percent of the cases obviously were alienated. How many of those are alienation? Uh, so the women come back for when that's contested, which means when it goes to trial, because yeah. that, that 85%, most don't go to trial. 70% the man wins and it's almost always parental alienation. The right. Rucky case would, is an example and that did go to trial and the man did win. That would, I'm having trouble, find, everybody says 70%. I'm having trouble finding where that 70% came from, but they all use it.
Uh, but I do believe that when it goes to trial, the man gets more than 50% of the time they win. Right, yeah. Because I have personally now, I have like, my view is skewed because that case, the Rocky case, that, that's what I do the most. So I'm more known for, so obviously primarily who's coming to me, domestic, female domestic violence victims, yeah. not always, but still, it's obviously skewed because who's going to hear about me more? It's not the men who are falsely accused, not as much. Yeah. Uh, though I've done those, but yeah. I have found it's more times than not, when it's gone to trial, the decision is favorable to the man. Right. And that is and look, finding, they, isn't it? It's a fact finding. It's the same as that. Right. But it, the judges are given us so much, like one that I saw, the, the guy admitted to the judge that if he gets custody, I'll have to move in with his parents because he can't take care of the kid on his own. Mm. Mom can take care of the kid on her own. Yeah. Uh, he the kid is autistic uh so the, you know there's all this testimony about how difficult the guy was making yeah. getting all of the services the judge ignores all of that and says but dad will probably be the better co-parent so i'm going to give him physical custody and the first and by the way the first thing dad does so this when it occurred it happened in new york he moved to li live with his parents far away from mom so that's the kind of co-parent he was. So a, she, but she just made it up, right? Out of the clear blue sky, she ignores everything else the female judge, Judge George, Gerald, Gerald George, I think, Geraldine George, but um, just ignores everything. It's like, an, like a 12, 13 day trial, ignores everything, says he's gonna be the co-parent and based on her impression, gives him physical custody. And by the way, afterwards, it came out that he was sexually abusive and now, Surprise, now he's right? lost custody, finally, is being investigated for sexual abuse. Yeah. Now that didn't come out, but you would think that a child molester may have left other red flags for another judge to have yeah. found. And, and of course he did. Yeah. She yeah. just ignored them all. And this is what, what courts, look, in the Rocky case, they basically said, uh, we don't believe the abuse allegation. This is in the fact finding. And that fact finding was like 70 pages. But we don't believe the abuse allegations. We've been trying really hard to get dad reunited with kids. Mom is not buying in. Mom is uncooperative. Mom is uncooperative. Yeah. And they use that. So mom is uncooperative. And that's the reason. And yeah. so think about it. And it's the same in your case, right? So you're uncooperative. Well, how would you be cooperative? By encouraging your kids to embrace their sexual abuser. Exactly. The same thing with her, right? Exactly. So I know dad stuck a gun to your head. But you should spend quality time with dad. Yeah. I know that dad choked you last year, but you should, this is what they want, right? Um, and if you don't do it, they will, the best story out of the US that I broke, this was five, six years ago. There was a woman named Angela Hickman. Her ex, Angelo, was convicted of beating her. He was convicted, right? So they still did the parental alienation scam. And at one point, one of the, and they, this, uh, this is why there doesn't need to be bribery in the US, by the way. They appoint like four or five people. They charge $200 an hour. What do you need to bribe yeah. somebody for? Yeah. You're coercing $200 an hour. So one of these people, they come up with this great idea. Let's have like, like co-therapy where mom and dad and kids. And mom is like, well, I'm not going to show up within three feet of the person who threw me down the stairs, among many other things. Oh, you're uncooperative and they take the kids. And they use that. If you're unwilling to do this therapy, then you're obviously not buying into our program. And then they took him and they accused her of parental alienation. And I think they even said, this is one of the worst cases I saw. Okay, the dad is convicted of hitting mom. How could it be so bad? Isn't it possible some of dad's action probably contributed to whatever alienating feelings he's feeling? How could it be the worst? I can't believe that it was just mom creating this problem for dad. I'm thinking dad probably had like 70, 80, 90, 98.9% .9 to do with whatever alienated feelings he's feeling right now since he was convicted of it. But it's not, it, even with the conviction, and this is what, what I, like the, the people, the proponents, this is what bothers me. This guy was convicted. It's not enough. It's never enough. It doesn't it, matter. It, it, stop telling me, stop telling, of course, we've never give kids uh, in abusive state. Well, that would never happen. No, you would, because it always happens because it's never enough. It doesn't matter. You had a positive drug test that you were begging for them to give. And then it's still not enough because okay. yeah, no, you must have done it. You must have done it. 
And, and of course, they don't actually have any evidence that you did it. Yeah. Right. They no, just said you must. Right. You must have done it. Yeah. And and it's enough in family court. And I don't know how. Like, if they tried, there. I wrote an article about AFCC, and and in it, like, the New York State District Attorneys Associations. These are the the prosecutors in New York State. They sent out a memo and they said, if somebody tries to use PAS, parental initial syndrome, knock it down. It has no scientific basis. It's not allowed in court. Don't allow it in. It's total garbage, right? This is what they, like a memo to every prosecutor in the state. Yes. If they try this, you knock it out because it doesn't. In in criminal court, there are actual rules which stop something like parental alienation syndrome because it doesn't, it doesn't have the kind of acceptance that a criminal court will allow. Um, but in family court, they can just say it. And, and, and again, the same thing in the Rocky case, the more the kids disclosed, the more it was evidence of parental alienation yeah. and the same with yours. Well, look, yeah. she was begging for the test. So obviously it came up positive. She must have drugged them. Yes. And there you go. There's our parental alienation. There's, it, that's like a story they spun. Um, do you know what, do you know what I find interesting? I, I looked up the actual, um, the actual Salem witch trials and we're, we're not that far advanced. So they had something called spectral evidence. So spectral evidence was if I came into court and I said, you know what? Last week I dreamed that Samantha Baldwin was a witch. I dreamed it in my dream. They could let me testify. Wow. <laughs> so this, how is what, how is what the court did any different? Yeah. You, they just dreamed it up out of the clear blue sky. You're, you're exactly. like, please, please give them this test. They're like, no, we won't give them the test. You bag, plead, bag, plead. They finally give them the test. Comes back positive. Oh, well, then you must have drugged that. Yeah, she's done it because she persisted in getting the hair tested. Therefore, yeah, she right, had right. the police investigation. And the, the most wacky thing I've ever heard was when I went for appeal and um, I never got leave to appeal. Um, mm. But the, the high court judge, my, my barrister submitted that, well, there's evidence of my healthy lifestyle. Um, there's, there's clear evidence that I, I would only give my, my children um, organic food, you know, and, and no chemicals. Right. And the judge said that I would be more likely to drug them because I cared about them and I was health, you know, I gave them a healthy diet. I was like, how does that right. make sense? Yeah. So you, you knew, well, they're so healthy, I can risk it. Is that what they're saying? You, you, you kept them so healthy. I can, I can stick them with a drug because they're so healthy. I can risk it. Yeah, no, it, none of it. They, it's all their own perception. And look, they most likely your judge, all these judges, they already had this planned out before I think you so. walked in yeah. for the first one. So they're just working yeah. their way back. Same thing in the Rocky case. They came up with this, that, and the other about her. Uh, like she was this psycho, except somehow she was never a psycho until she got divorced. Like yeah. she w- worked for an airline. They kept giving her psych tests. Everything is fine, right? Yeah. There's no criminal record. Yeah. She grew up in a wealthy family. Uh, everything is fine. And then she just couldn't handle the divorce and she went crazy. And then she did all of this. And, and this is what they want you to believe. Uh, and it's the same with you. Uh, like you never had anything, but somehow you schemed to force the court to test your sons because you had plan and, and then yeah, what like yeah. like like you knew exactly when they would order the test or you just yeah. knew that since you'd already done it well it's a hair test it just lasts yeah. so long yeah exactly that that's right. it that's it it's, mm-hmm. it's absolutely madness it's it's mm-hmm. it, it's like you say it's a big it's the biggest scam that that's the way I, I describe the family court it's just one big scam what would you mm-hmm. um what advice would you give to say if there's right in the early stages if if a child discloses sexual abuse to the to the mother by the father what what advice would you give them right, right. so first of all in a situation like that you always hire the best lawyer you can afford so don't take advice from anyone but a good lawyer but you document everything you record everything you can including mm-hmm. surreptitiously if you can pull it off mm-hmm. these people say one thing they write another thing down they will make promises to you that they have no intention of keeping, that you will have no, re, like, like you, you won't be able to come back with anything unless it's recorded. Right. They will say, you know what, once this test comes back, if it's negative, like you say, we'll give you your kids back. They'll give you that promise. Mm-hmm. They have no intention of keeping it unless you have it recorded. Um, you know, I just did, uh, I, I just did something, it was a D, 
they call it Department of Social Services out of North Carolina. And it's this mom is talking to a caseworker and they took her two kids because the kids had wandered off in a hotel. All right. For, for people who have kids, kids wander off, right? Yeah. So, so they, they show up basically like a SWAT team, social services does, stick an order in her hand and it's called a consent order and coerce her into signing a consent or does it sound like she's consenting or does it sound a little worse? Than, so she refuses to sign it. They still take her kids. She calls the guy and she says, I'd like a copy of the court order you got to take my kids. He goes, what court order? The court order you have to take my kids. We don't have a court order. And then she says, well, I'd like my kids back then. And he says, no, we can keep them. And he goes on and then he misquotes the law. And so the key part of the story is it's all recorded. Yeah. There's no way to prove that this guy, like in a blatant and full of hubris way, just ignored the law unless you record, but they are all corrupt. They're all full yeah. of themselves. Yeah. They are more and more uh, understanding the people recording them. So they're more careful. Uh, some of these people will like frisk you, but get the best lawyer you can follow you. If you have a good lawyer, follow your lawyer's advice record everything you can keep everything. These people contradict themselves all the time. You can catch them right. that, and look, the, the other thing that I would say with, with situations like this, you always have a play. No, no matter, don't do not. Oh my God, it's over. Whatever happened. Um, you know, some visit went really bad. Uh, the, the custody trial went really bad. A hearing went really bad. You always have a play. All right. You are being victimized. What's happening here is not really supposed to be allowed. So you figure out how to, how to get back. It's hard. You're facing judges, you're facing lawyers, you're in, in our system, guardian name, all these other people, but they have vulnerabilities. They do. One of them being that this is probably not the only case where they're doing it. If you can bring all the cases out, like your, your judges, no okay. angel. I don't think he walks into other courtrooms and goes, okay, uh, now that I get done screwing Sam, I'm going to be a good judge again. Exactly. I don't think that's how he does it. No. David Knudsen isn't that way. All of these people, the Department of Social Services. Look, I, I don't know that much about CAFCAS, but I don't think it's any better than what our Child Protective Services is. And, and in fact, the entire social services, child protective, whatever you call it, globally. It's all a total mess. In my opinion, you should just get rid of it. Uh, nice, yeah. you, there's ways to get rid of family court as well. Though... Um, but that's the advice I would give. Okay. If you can get a good lawyer, document everything. There's always a place. So don't panic. There is a play. You have to figure it out. Okay, thank you. And what would you say, say if there's any teenagers watching this who disclosed abuse by their father and they were sub subsequently placed in the care of the father, banned from all contact with the mother, how would you, if they're watching right now, how would you explain to them um, why this has happened? It's happening because there's a lot of money to be make, made to make it happen. You're a pawn. Probably going to hear that term a lot. You're a pawn. No one cares about you. They're willing to sacrifice your childhood because somebody somewhere is making a lot of money, uh, maybe through a bribe, maybe legally, maybe both. But the, the people doing this to you don't care about you. They don't care about kids like you. It's unfortunate. So hopefully when you grow up and you have a chance to fight back, you're going to fight for, for kids like you. Uh, cause this is happening out of pure greed. Yeah. Um, there's, a uh, it's arguably the two worst cops in the U S history. There are these two guys, Stephen Carrick Kappa and Luis Apolito, uh, and they killed for the mafia. They would take on contracts. And I remember the, the prosecutor said it really well. She said, they did all this out of pure greed. Mm -hmm. That's what made it even worse than anything else. There's no yeah. other reason. Yeah. They wanted more money than their cop salary. It's the same thing with these people. Yeah. They're they, they can't make money honestly enough to sustain the lifestyle they want. So they're willing to place you in the hands of abusers because that gives them an extra amount, possibly legally, maybe also illegally on top of it, maybe both, who knows? But that's why they're doing it, a pure greed, right. as the prosecutor said. Uh, that's what I would say to them. Thank you. Thanks for that. Well, I've just, um, I think we're done there now, Mike. Okay. Um, so thanks so much for coming on. Unless you've got anything else you'd like to finish off on. Um, no, that's it. Yeah, that's I'll, it. I'll put a, anyone watching this, I'll put the links in the description below um, some of um, mm -hmm. Mike's articles that, I, that he's done that are absolutely amazing. So have a read through those. 
um, and then she can send me that that video you described of the mm -hmm. lawyer being handcuffed. That that would be right. interesting to see. And you're on social media, aren't you? You're on Twitter and Facebook. Right, at, my, at Mike Volpe. I'm on Facebook as well, but I reached 5,000 fr Facebook friends. I'm very popular. Okay. Only, if only <laughs> this was true in high school. But um, so you can try, but I, I'm like having to get rid of Facebook friends, but I'm on both. You're Twitter, on Twitter at, yeah, at Mike Volpe. Yeah. At Mike Volpe and, and on LinkedIn. I've actually made like a fair amount of connections through LinkedIn as well. So more people should use LinkedIn as well. Uh, I, that's, might, uh, I might join that platform. I'm not on there right. at the moment. So yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Great. And uh, so you can find me in any, any of those places. Yeah. And I'm freelance. So I do them in a lot of different places. I did do a, what I thought was an interesting article for something called the American Conservative about judges using very marginal re COVID related reasons to switch custody. Like, one mom took a photo of herself without a mask. And he's like, yeah. oh, you're one of these rabid anti-maskers. we got to take custody. And that one, there's an audio recording. And it's a great example of hubris in judges. Yeah. Uh, what you think judges behave like and what they actually behave like is so different. Yeah. You think that they're speaking the soft tone. Well, yes, sir. Well, here's how I think of it. No, they scream at you. They yell at you. They bully you. Uh, and that audio recording is just one of many examples. Uh, so check that out as well. Yeah, great. Well, thanks very much, Mike. I'm sure um, I'd love to have you on again at some point as well. And uh, we'll speak soon. Okay, take, take care. care.